be what are called the triple gems of Jainism. You want to have right faith, right knowledge, right conduct. So that's samyak. It's like the true, true faith, true knowledge, right conduct. Faith, knowledge, and conduct. Well, what did that look like? Well, let's start with faith. These are the main aspects of Jain belief. And really, they kind of treat these as substances, like these are things that are. Now, some of these will be familiar terms to some degree, like moksha, the last one there. But this is really the framework for how it functions here in Jainism. And the thing I want to stress here with Jainism is how it's different from, again, from Hinduism. So in Hinduism, what's karma? And how does that relate to samsara? And dharma? Yeah, the more conscious you are, then you do your dharma, because a conscious being knows how to do its dharma. Do your dharma. Karma, which allows you to come back more conscious in samsara, to the eventual point of moksha, you're completely out of it. The thing that's different in Jainism is karma is a stuff that sticks to you. It's not just some sort of sort of cosmic legality like it is in Hinduism. You do evil actions, you cause harm, there's almost like this stuff that sticks to you. The nerd that I am, I picture like the venom symbiont from Spider-Man, right? Like this black goo that just sticks to you. Every time you do some kind of harm, okay, it sticks to you. It might not be visible, but it sticks to you. And it's weighing you down, and that's what's weighing you in the cycle of samsara. It's almost like these, <laughs> this karmic goo just holding you down as weight. So what are the stuffs? Seven stuffs. First of all, we got jiva. So that's a consciousness. That's a you. Okay, Hinduism uses the, almost all this language here, too. I, I, I know I've, I've really focused on samsara, karma, and dharma. But in pretty much... In India, all these words are used in all these religions, and they mean different things, but I don't want to give you all of them. I just want to focus really on those ones. So what's a jiva? That's a you. Okay, in Hinduism, that's usually atman, like the... And it, it means just an individual conscious self. And so what are ajiva? Non-conscious things. Is the table conscious? No. So it's ajiva. It's a thing, but it's not a jiva. Okay, then, what is this one? Asrava. Asrava, that is when you get the karma sticking to you. Okay, it's karma that sticks to you. So it's not just the action, it really is like a, almost like a, I don't want to say physical stuff, but it's a stuff that exists. It is a, I know this doesn't sound like proper English, it is a stuff that's out there. So that's Asrava, that's that stuff that sticks to you. And so then what is Banda? That's consciousness that's been messed up by karma. So in other words, you think of it almost like a math problem. Jiva plus Asrava equals Bandha. Now we don't want that. That's not good. But that's what causes us then, when you do bad things, and what do I mean by bad thing? Because that sounds nebulous. When you cause harm, that's what causes karma to stick to you. The causing of harm. What kind of harm? Any kind of cause. I know sometimes when we think of non-harm, we're specifically thinking of non-violence. But there's different kinds of non-violence. And the Jains take it to the most extreme. So when we think of non-violence, we especially mean physical violence. Right? I'm not going to solve my problems with my fists. Or with weapons of some kind. But perhaps you've heard the expression, which I disagree with. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words shall never harm me. Has anyone heard that before? I don't agree with that sentence. Words do harm. They do. Now, not with the same, uh, yes, they don't shatter bones with a word, right? Huzzah! And now your femur's cracked. Okay, it doesn't work quite that way. But certainly, a certain person saying certain kinds of words can cause psychological harm, which may even result in later physical harm. It Really, I, I think that's true. And so do the James. It doesn't harm need not be purely and immediately physical. You can harm by what you say. You can harm by what you think. If you're thinking negatively enough about other people, it will affect what you do and what you say. Especially if you linger on it. If you really hate somebody, it's when you see, the, you see someone and you just, your blood starts to boil. You will treat them differently, even if you try and do that thing where you look all polite in the face. 
how you talk to other people. Can you believe that they did this and that? And that? that will cause harm. How you think, how you feel, how you believe. So this bundle, this consciousness has been tainted by karma, and it keeps, it keeps doing harm. In other words, the more you entertain harming others, the more you will want to harm. Because that stuff gets in you, and then it's like itself like a cycle. Once you entertain it, you like harming others, guess what you want to do more of? Harming others. Don't allow it. Well, how do you do that? Some water. Stop it. So, you know, I, I have the, the difference between, say, Samwara and Nirgana here is this one, the first one there, Samwara, is stopping it. Stop accumulating karma. Well, how do I stop? How do I stop it? Stop harming. Well, how do I do that? I'm addicted to harm. Stop it. Just stop it. Stop using physical violence, verbal violence, and mental violence. Don't even let yourself entertain the thought of harming others. Well, how could anyone do this? Well, Jane's do it. Remember? <laughs> I, think, I, I think I showed you the image. They carry around, they put where the masks lie. So they don't accidentally inhale, yeah, flies or insects. Sometimes they carry brooms with them. Why? You have to sweep other animals that they could, like insects and other things that they might accidentally step on, they sweep them out of the way. Okay, so they will carry, especially uh, Dikambar, okay, which is a certain order in yeah, Jainism. So really, let's not cause harm at all. Okay. But also, so that we got to stop that, but then the extrication, then through the proper kinds of rituals, we might be able to not just stop accumulating karma, because one thing, like, all right, I'm not doing any more karma, but I've already got this, it's already piled up. Well, how do I get rid of all of it that's already there? That next one. Well, how do I do that? Doing the right things. This is the right faith. Through right conduct is how we get that, you know, that's how we get that extrication. And what is, all it means to extricate is to take something and get rid of it and put it away. I could hit, I could hear, you know, karmic taking out the trash. Getting rid of it, there you go. To the point where we achieve here moksha, it's not just getting out of samsara. It is. But here, getting rid of, the only way to get out of the cycle of rebirth here is to annihilate all karma from consciousness. It's got to be all scooped out. No leftovers. So this is a start. So here's basically the schema. Here's what you need to know. This is the seven steps out there. And there's a sense in which these are all called, these are all substances. Some of that... It's not just that karma is a substance. There's a sense in which the karmic cessation is a substance, so I don't want to get into that too much here because that, that seems counterintuitive. But for our purposes, I think we'll get into this one a lot. Okay. Well, that's the right faith. What's the right knowledge? And this is another one that Western minds have a hard time with. Anakantavada, which is many-sidedness. Oh, that's how it's translated, many-sided. In other words, there are many ways to look at something, and you should know that. Now, has anyone here, have you ever gotten into an argument with somebody about some serious set of facts? Okay. All right. It could be something really serious. Okay. Like you're having like a philosophical debate with somebody. You're like, no, the death penalty is wrong. No, it's not wrong. Like it's a, a more serious argument like that. Or it could be like, oh, I can't believe you put the dishes in the dishwasher this way. Okay. Glasses go on top. Okay. All the forks go together. Okay. Just put them all together. It could be something benign like that. But in any situation where you find yourself in an argument, what do you think about your own view? I'm what? Right. I'm right, exactly. I'm right. And, so, even, and have you ever had a, a moment where you realized that you were wrong? Like, you listen. I don't know where you put my keys, but I know I saw you with them earlier, and I know you had them, so I want to know where you, where you put them. And... Um, yeah, I'm just going to go look around again just to make, make sure. And they're in your pocket or something like that. Where you've made a mistake and then you realize you're not right. But then even there, we still kind of want to at least play pretend like we're right for a while. Oh, never mind. I found him. <laughs> Silly me. You might do that if you're humble enough. But odds are if you're not humble enough, you don't have the humility there. You're going to be like, no, 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 no. Working. Yeah, I found where you put them. Mm-hmm. They're right over there. You should have done this. Why do we do that? 
not just with the lying, but we, we intensely think that we are correct. Have you ever gotten into an argument with somebody? Like, it could be about something superficial, where you either made someone really upset, especially if it's about nothing, where either you made someone upset or they made you upset. Maybe even just from the tone. I've seen this happen before too. It's just about like the most, sometimes it can be about the most ridiculous stuff. I can't believe this character did this on this TV show. Well, here's why it's justifiable. And I've seen friendships get shattered over stuff like that. Talking about books or you know, TV show characters or movies, like just, but, but why do we do that? Because we have a great sense of self-importance. We're all, first of all, in our lives, we always think of ourselves as the main. We're the main character in our lives, but also kind of in the universe. Like, well, really, everybody else is a supporting has a supporting role, and it's in me, 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 me. And we always think that we're right. We always think that our point of view is right. Here's the deal, though. No, you're often wrong, and you haven't always been here. And this notion of I'm right in a domineering way is itself violence. Now, you might immediately object and think, well, wait a minute. Don't the Jains think they're right about their own practice? Sure, they do. But there's not an antagonistic kind of proselytizing at all. There's even an admittance, maybe we're wrong. Maybe, the, maybe we are wrong. It's at least possible. I don't think you're going to see that in too many other religions that are, especially the ones that are more dogmatic, that have very specific creeds. You have to believe this, 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 and this. Now, I'm sure there are dogmatic Jains out there, right? There that that are, would be exceptions to this, for sure. But at least in practice, this notion of many-sidedness. Maybe we're mistaken, but maybe everybody's mistaken. Maybe ever, maybe even so. Someone like remember in Jainism, is there one big God? No. Maybe in some way the Muslims are right in the way that they're describing. Maybe there is something that they're getting right when they're talking about Allah. Maybe it has something to do with nature or reality or the Christians with the triangle. Maybe there's something that they're grasping that they put into monotheism, but they might be right in some kind of way. Maybe they're looking at it from an angle we don't understand. Maybe we're looking at things from a different angle. Maybe we're all looking at things from different angles. That's this notion. Often we see things in very, we, we do this, in the West we like to put things in binary structures very often. Zeros and ones. The light's either on or it's off. What is it, what is it, if it's flickering, what's happening? Hmm. It's on off. Or we, we don't like it, we really like things, like uh, sometimes like if someone, if there's a debate on something, we usually collapse it into saying there's two sides. Yeah, of a line. Are there three sides to a triangle? Yeah, not two. Okay, in complex issues, it might be, we I might be even be introducing other dimensions. We might be looking at things from different angles, but we like to put things, well, here's what, like, like in this country, like in politics, you might say, here's what the Republicans think, and here's what the Democrats think. Are those the only two political parties in existence? Well, in this country, for the most part. But are those the only, are, must every idea be collapsible into one of these two ideological systems? No. But we like to think of it that way. Like there's good and there's evil. Anything in between? No, there can't be. So we like those binaries. And sometimes we even like singularities. There's only this. The Jain belief here is neither singularity nor binary. There's a whole multiplicity of, expected, of perspectives. And the perspectives themselves are entirely legitimate. We might not agree with it. But maybe, and maybe there's something to it. Maybe there's something to it. Every perspective is welcome. Even, and that doesn't mean you have to subscribe to it. That is, that is not to say every belief is correct. But it is to say maybe it is. And we'll respect that. To do otherwise, to say nope, is violence. So if you say shut up, you're wrong. And even if you're not militaristic about it. Or domineering. You're wrong. To do that is harmful. The Jains will not do it. They will simply say that's what they say. Now, there's a part of this that reminds me of ancient skepticism. Okay, and the ancient skeptics had this practice uh, that they called uh, epoche, where they said, you know, you would know what a belief is without having to believe it yourself. 
But if you're going to study something, know what the beliefs are, but you don't have to agree with it, but know what it is. And that just produces, in Greek, a feeling called ataraxia, where you go, you know what, I'm not going to know everything, and that's OK. There's something like that here, too. OK? Maybe we could be wrong. Now, we don't do this, even when we have reason to doubt. And it's not just religions that say this. We know this, that God exists. You know, you can hear a scientist today say, we know that the Earth has existed for four and a half billion years. And maybe it has. I'm not denying that claim at all. But maybe there might be other information where we learn something, we will learn something new later that might dispute that in some new way. Not that we were mistaken, there might be some new model in the future where we can explain things differently. You know, oh, okay, actually, this is the case. Just say, we know now. Dogmatism. So there's an anti dogmatism here in Jainism. Okay, so that would be the right knowledge, which brings us to right practice. So Jains take five vows. And there are monks in Jainism as well. And really, the difference there is there's not additional, well, in some schools of Jain thought there are additional vows, but everybody takes these vows as a Jain. Now, some of these vows are more intense than others, more intensive. So they, there might be matters of degree. So, vow number one, ahimsa, nonviolence. And like I said, for not everybody's a monk, so not everybody's going to have the brooms where they sweep things, but at least as much as possible, not going to cause harm. But we can do that more or less intensely. You might wear the mask, you might have the broom, all other things. As I said before, this is why very rarely are Jains farmers or keepers of animals. Are they going to slaughter the animals? Are they going to be butchers? No. Are they going to be farmers and harvest crops and cut them down? No. Most of the time, they're merchants. So long as there's not harm there. Okay, that's number one. Two, no, point number two, satya, which is just the word for truth. Like Gandhi's notion of satyagraha. Satya just means truth. We'll see that again just uh, when we get to Buddha as well. Truthfulness. Deceit is violence. Deceit, deception, falsehood is always violence. Because why do we lie? Yeah, to get our exactly. You only lie for your own benefit. Even well, I might be lying to save someone else. Maybe, but probably something that you're attached to. All deception comes from attachment, over attachment, and passion, and ultimately, really at the end of the day, comfort. So you might, and it might be a, a benign lie, okay? So if someone could do something really, really treacherous, and, you know, go into something and commit all kinds of fraud, why would they do that? To get money for themselves. That would be a deception. That, of course, who, who's it benefiting? You, because you really like you. But also you might be thinking like, oh, I told, here's one, people do this all the time, where they'll tell a story that's not true because it makes them look kind of good. Like, oh yeah, I remember, I remember when I met them. Yeah, it was really cool and this thing happened and it didn't happen. Who does this benefit? You. Because it makes you look at least interesting in the moment. Yeah, no, you might think, oh, no, it was, it was a harmless white lie. No deception is ever unharmful. It's always harmful. It might be harming you. What did you do then when you told that lie? You just accumulated some of that karmic stuff. Right then and there. And despite being merchants often, the third vow is asteia which is non-stealing, because thievery is violence. And what do we mean by thievery here? Because people have all kinds of technical de definitions here. I didn't steal anything. They signed it away in the contract. Okay, so, so any kind of deceptive contract where you know you're trying to swindle someone or fool them, okay, particularly of treaties that both especially treaties of the, uh, the United States with American Indians. Hey, just sign this paper here and we'll give you all this land when the actual paper says we'll take it away from you. Just sign right here, just sign here, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll read you what it says in English that you don't know, but yeah, just go ahead and sign. All right, you signed it and now you're gone. What was the intent there? To swindle. No, what do I mean by swindle? To deceive. But yeah, but they signed the contract. 
far less harmful, I will say, but it's like us when you know, you know when you get to something like if you download an app or you go to a website and it's like you must, you know, scroll down and agree and you're like, yeah, whatever, scroll, 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 scroll. Yeah, I have read and agree. Click, submit. Okay, some of that stuff is meant to deceive you as well, right? So who, like for example, on Facebook and Instagram, who owns your photos? You? Facebook does. Facebook owns Instagram, so everything you've ever posted on Instagram, Facebook owns. You do not. You're like, no, I'll delete my account. All, everything you ever put up there, Facebook owns. They can use it however they want. Right? They can. Well, they probably won't. But they could. Is that deceptive? Well, I can't believe Facebook, <laughs> Facebook or Twitter or whoever is doing this stuff. You signed up for it. But they put it in a user agreement that no one's ever going to read. Right? So is that deceptive? Kind of, but it's kind of on everybody. But it's still harmful regardless. Like trying to mess with people to get what you want. Being deceptive. Selling something that's broken. Oh yeah, it works fine. Totally fine. It's held, it's held together with duct tape and wishes. Okay, that kind of thing? Attempting to cheat? Counterfeiting of any kind? All of that is harm. Got number four. What's this one? Chastity. Now here again, the intensity depends on one. Are you a lay person or are you a monk? What do I mean by chastity? Sexual temperance. So some Jains, some Jains are married and have families. Their sexual activity is relegated to the spouse and the spouse alone. If one is unmarried, to no one. All right, and that that would include things like masturbation as well. Like that's out because why? Where does that come from? Passion. And whose pleasure do you want there? Your own. Stop it. And of course, with the monks here as well, complete uh, sexual abstinence altogether. Because that, what happens there? One builds up attachment. One builds up passion. One builds up desire, causing harm. Now we know this here. How much, how much sexual harm do we hear about? It can be harmful. I'm not saying it is harmful, but it can be harmful in all kinds of ways. It can produce all kinds of psychological problems, physical problems, from results. And how many laws do we have against, say, sexual harassment and assault? Why do we have laws against those things? Because they happen often. We hear about this a lot lately. That's the problem. Here, rain it in. Well, like I said, in varying degrees. If you're a monk, you all together. If you're someone in a family, keep it in the house. Okay, and then finally, the last one, a paragraha, non-possession. There's an, in spite of being merchants and merchants want to produce money, there it's really just to get sustenance. You don't own anything. What are you going to take with you when you die? A jiwa, maybe, but not much. So not only so, and often what this implies is that communities own things together. So I mentioned the brooms. It's not like some, I've got my broom. You got your. community shares those things. So here we have a, a huge communal aspect. And it's interesting. It's a, not a hierarchical community. There's not really a priest or rabbi at the head of the community. It's the community as the community. No one, there's not really, there's not, I don't own anything because ownership is attached. That's mine. What does that cause? Harm. When people have signs in their yard that say, beware of dog, what's the point? Scare people. Yeah, scare people away. Get on my, <laughs> get off my property or else what? Well, now, I'm not talking about someone like causing, like trying to invade property or steal property. I'm talking about, oh, I didn't mean to walk in here. Get off my property. What? Because it's mine. And if you don't get off of my stuff, I will harm you. None of that here. Ownership is not caused. Because ownership causes harm. Because people think that's mine, it's mine. And this need not be the adult with a shotgun. Have you ever seen children fighting over a toy? Mine, give it! Start pulling each other's hair out. 
interesting because the notion of possession is directly related, related to the notion of harm. I want it means I want it, or it's mine means it's not yours, and I'll do whatever I need to to make sure you don't have it. So the in, ownership is intrinsically has intrinsic animosity to it. All right, now I mentioned there are two basic denominations of Jainism. So you've got the Tridambara and the Digambara. And the Digambara are a little bit more restrictive. They're the ones that are also naked. If they can't, so remember, I mentioned there's degrees of the vows. The most extreme, the Digambara, are the ones that won't wear any clothes at all. Why? Because I'm not going to own clothes. Because then I would be owning something. One, I'd be owning something. And two, let's say it's made out of cotton, that would be harm to the cotton plant to make it. So I'm going to have as little as I possibly can. It's not because there's a love of nudity, because there's a love of ahimsa. Okay, but most of the Jains are the Shvetambara. Okay, the ones that are a little less extreme, more, probably going to be clothed. And there's one big festival, a festival, really a coming together, but we're not having a lot of food. Why not? It's going to cause harm. Well, yeah, we're just they get it together. And what they do to each other in this Parishana, which is once a year on the calendar, is they get together and they say this. Chichami Dokada. Or Doka means like lacking, wrongness, error, pain. It'll come up in Buddhism again, Dukkha. But basically this says here, Michami Dukadam. May my error lack. This is what it literally means there. May my error be lacking. What does that mean? May any harm I've done be ineffective. I hope some evil that I did does not go through. I, I hope it doesn't matter. All right, so it's, it's kind of like that. Like, like basically they get together and they apologize to each other. But it's not an apology. It's not, oh, I'm sorry. But here's what had happened was, I was just pointing out, look, I hope any evil that I've done doesn't work, doesn't go through. If I could, I'd take it back. That's what they say to each other. Why? Try it. Any harm that's been released out into the world, let's rein it in. And that's the ritual that we have here. Coming together, talking to one another, trying to say, literally say, if I've harmed you in some way, let's deal with it now. I'm sorry, let's, get, let's make it go. That's what we see here in Jainism. And then another practice that we see here, which to Westerners, is, this is the one that's probably the most outrageous, is Salakana. So many Jains, especially of the stricter variety, when they get old in life, when they are when they are elderly, they will starve themselves to death. Now, this is to attain moksha, and this is also because there's a point where I'm already old. What I want to do here is I want to harm as I want to I want to go, preferably get out of samsara at, in so doing. And I'm, I will die by causing no harm to another being at all. If I can get to that point. Now, this is not something you would force someone to do. This is completely voluntary. Because if you force someone, you're not going to eat. That's starving someone else. That's violence. But I will do this to myself, on my own. My community will support me in it. And it's entirely voluntary. When I'm old, and I'm ready to do this, I will do it so I can, I can leave this world, preferably never to return, if I achieve moksha without harming anything, rather than me consuming something that keeps me going. Because if, and if, if we look at that as something lamentable, like, oh, I can't believe they do that. That's so sad. Well, that's the problem with attachment right there. People that want to persist and keep on, remember this world is suffering anyway from a, a Jane point of view. Now, all of life really is suffering. This is not a great place to be. But here I can leave it on my own voluntarily without causing harm to any, anything else. That's how I want to go in Jane thought. The, this would be I, the ideal way to die. Not with a sword in hand. Not in a bed perpetually on life support. But by fasting oneself unto death. Salakat. This is the inside of a Jane temple. 
Mahavira up there. The community, and this word will pop up again too when we talk about Buddhism as well, the Sangha. Sangha, that's the community at large. Now, keep in mind that I said the Jain community, the Sangha, like if that, that ritual starving oneself to death there too, someone might do it alone, but probably you've got your family there with you to support you. And in the community, like I said, in the Sangha, in Jainism, there is no hierarchical structure. There are monks and lay people, and I've got their respective terms right here. So here are our monks, Muni for the males, Aika for the females, and then the Sharaka for the layman, and Sharaika for the women, for lay people. What is a lay person? That's where you're not a monk. You're just an average adherent. So if you're a member, if you're a member of a religion and you're not one of the religious advisors, you're not a pastor, you're not an imam, you're not a rabbi, you are a lay person. Laity. But we see here, th those are the designations, but there's no, it's not like the monks are higher than the lay people, they just have stricter vows. There's not, a, like I said, there's not a sense of hierarchy. If anything, this is indicative of a kind of rhizomatic community. Where everybody's considered equal in the community, because really even imposing a structure would be a kind of harm, wouldn't it? Now you'll notice, now we call it in English Buddhism. I, most people call it, I hear like, like the Buddhism, like it's scary. Buddhism. It's really, it really should be pronounced more like Buddhism, but that's neither here nor there. I know what you're talking about when you say Buddhism. Buddhism. Or as it's called in Sanskrit, it would be, well, look at that, Bhagavad Dharma. And there's that word Dharma again. And really, really, that would mean something like the, the, what is dharma? Now remember, in Hinduism, it meant like a duty, right? The word here would mean something more like, and we'll talk about, like, dharma would mean in Buddhism, like, reality. It's really like the reality of the Buddha. And sort of, we could say, like, the teaching of the Buddha. Now, who's the Buddha? Well, that's a representation of the Buddha. That's not the Buddha himself. Who's the Buddha? Well, what does even the word Buddha mean? Well, there's a couple of terms that we need to know. Siddhartha Gautama. Who is Siddhartha Gautama? I've heard some say Gautama. That's fine. That is Buddha. Well, that's his real name. Buddha is kind of an honorific. He has many honorifics. Now, probably lived about 2,500 years ago. I say probably because some dispute exactly when he lived. There are some that disputed that whether he lived at all, that, that's, that, and that's well and good. All right, there's always that. So, probably around 2,500 years ago. Or thereabouts. It's hard to come with exact dates because of where he lived. Nepal, yeah, Nepal. He's from Nepal. Where's Nepal? There's China, there's India. It's right in the middle. In the, these are the Himalayan mountains. So if you want to go to Mount Everest, what country are you going to go to to climb it? This one. Literally, quite literally on top of the world. But also, yes, this is at the time, it's kind of like the borderlands between China and India of sorts. At the time, it would have been considered part of India. But we're talking on the fringes of India. So that ancient Vedic religion, not Brahman and all that, it's there, but this is on the outskirts, so it's not as well known. So some of the stuff is. It's like there are bits and pieces, but when Siddhartha grew up, there were probably some aspects of things like, oh yeah, Brahma is a deity, or Agni, like, they might have been well known, but they probably had their own deities too. So some of that made its way in, probably. But so do we got here? Well, he was a prince, Siddhartha was, here in Nepal. And here's the way the story goes. Now, how, how much can we attest to the reality or the truthfulness of this anecdotal story? I don't know, but here's, this is in multiple accounts. He grew up as a prince, and maybe there might have been like a, and in some versions of the story, there's like a prophecy saying, oh, one day the prince will leave the palace, he won't want to become king. Oh, no! So his parents, the king and the queen, like said, whatever we do, we're going to give him the best life possible. Some accounts don't have the whole prophecy thing. Okay. In most accounts, 
he had this lavish lifestyle. Okay, from his childhood into teens, where like everything that he could possibly want, his parents got for him, in this luxurious, lush palace life. Everything you could want, like just amazing. Okay, nothing but pleasure all the time, provided for by your parents. But just you know, <laughs> like a member of royalty in a Disney film, he has to escape. <laughs> there has to be so much more. So he sneaks out, just to, like, I don't know what's outside. He's never left the castle here in Nepal. So he leaves, and just for a day, goes outside and sees the following three things, again, according to the story. And there's um, different versions of this story. He sees an old man, a sick man, and a dead man. Now keep in mind, in his little pleasurable life at the palace, he's never seen any of these things. He's never seen someone old, never seen someone sick, and he's certainly never seen someone dead. But he sees all these in the span of a day. And keep in mind, these are all new experiences for him. So he's like, What's, what is that? Well, the gray hair, that person's old. Yeah, but why does their face look like a raisin? Well, because they got wrinkles, because they're old. Why are they hunched over and pain? Well, because they're old. I don't know what that means. Because he's never seen age. <coughs> Why is that person making that sound? Well, because they're sick. What? What's that? Oh, I'm in pain. What? He's never experienced it. And then, why is that guy not moving? He's dead. He's never seen death. Because like, his, cause his parents had shielded him from all this stuff, right? And so he's like, you know what? Being old be, looks pretty bad. Being sick looks pretty bad. Being dead looks really bad. So the world is not what I thought it was. So he goes back home, and he's like, you know what, Mom, Dad, I quit. I don't want to be the prince anymore. Like, and in some versions of the story, it's like, well, we knew this was going to happen. Uh, in other ones, like, well, okay, this is it, we're, we're, here we are at this crossroads. And he leaves, and he becomes an ascetic. Kind of like a Jain. He's not a Jain, but kind of like a Jain. They're actually... Jainism, the Mahavira, one of the big Jain figures, is around at the exact same time. That's Buddha. We know that they're contemporary. That's why we can say this is probably when he lived. And he becomes an ascetic. So what's an again? What's an ascetic? I said this was Jainism. What does that mean? The ascetic or asceticism it comes from a Greek word askesis, which means just just <laughs> means like nope. <laughs> Like I'm just going to it means to like one that abstains from as much pleasure as possible. Like I'm not I'm not gonna participate. Now for the Jains, it was that like if you're having pleasure, you're probably causing someone else's pain. If you feel really good, you're probably causing harm. Probably. If you're in, like, if you're enjoying a good steak dinner, you're doing it at the cow's expense. So pleasure. If you're enjoying a good wine, you're doing it at the Vine's expense. So really, pleasure seems to be tethered to harm. And that's why trying to avoid harm is uncomfortable. It's not easy. It's not pleasurable. But it's right. Well, Buddha's doing something similar. He's not the Buddha yet. In fact, here, I even have it up here. Usually before he has this moment of enlightenment, his nickname is the Bodhisattva. So if you're talking about Buddha before he's Buddha, he's still just regular Siddhartha. Yeah, Siddhartha Gautama is his real name, but he's called the Bodhisattva, which means the wise one. So pre-enlightenment Buddha is the Bodhisattva. What happens? So he tries asceticism. Okay, that is, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna eat anything. Okay, maybe like a grain of rice a day. I'm gonna drink only the water that I need. Kind of like what the Jains are doing. He's not influenced by Jainism directly, but he's trying to do kind of that. And he's doing this, at least in his own mind, to kind of make up for the lavish life that he had. Like, he had, like, extreme pleasure his whole life. So he's like, I'm going to do the opposite right now. And he does that for a while, and he realizes that's not, that doesn't, like, now I'm just hungry now. That's not working either. Like, this is not any more, I have not achieved wisdom from not eating anything. And causing as little harm as possible. So this is not working either. So he starts doing this practice called Jyana which is meditation. 
Diena. In fact, I think I have it up there in the notes too. But Diena in Chinese becomes Diena becomes Qian. And in Japanese, when it goes even further, Qian becomes Zen. What does the word mean? Just to meditate. Here in Sanskrit, Diena. So Diena, he's meditating, just you know, trying to think, contemplate on what? Just stop, just sit down and think. Not just on pleasure, not just think about, you know, how can I starve myself, how can I cause as little harm as possible. There is kind of a, 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 there is kind of a notion of ahimsa in Buddhism, as little harm as possible, but it's, it's a little bit different. It's not quite as direct. And sitting under a Bodhi tree, he has this moment of enlightenment where he, he comes to a realization. Lavishness is too much. Asceticism is also too much in the opposite direction. There has to be, uh, if this is over here, there's too much, maybe too little, okay, both extremes, then there has to be a, what he calls a madhyama pratipat. Okay, there has to be a middle ground. And sure, there has to be a middle ground. And then he comes to the conclusion of what that madhyama pratipat is. Literally, like middle path. Madhyama which means middle, and then pratipat, pat like, like a podiatrist, that pat, that word for foot, it's still there. Okay, there has to be a middle path. So what does that middle path look like? Well, the first conclusion of the middle path, of what that is, of not overdoing it, not living like a luxurious prince, and not underdoing it, living like an extreme ascetic monk. Yes, there are Buddhist monks. And some of them would be more extreme than others, but not to the extreme like James. Because Buddha's going to say, like, no, don't, don't overdo it, don't starve yourself to death. Here's what you do need to realize, though. This. Okay? So this is, the, this is the first principle of the Madhyama Pratipa. And let's start with this, too. Of course, what's in the atmosphere? The notion of samsara. There is a, that is in every Indian religion. Okay? What, do we, what happens when you die? You come back again. Just like a theme in Abrahamic religion, all of them... Christianity and Islam, you die, eventually you will get resurrected. There will be a resurrection. And then God will judge you. That's true in all three of those. Okay, so the circumstances of how it works out are different, but that's true. That's what they have in common. So same here. Samsara is in common. We, we keep coming back. We keep coming back. We keep coming back. What makes you keep coming back here? Now in Hinduism, remember, it's, it's our karma. But our karma is in relation to our dharma. Do your dharma, get better karma. Eventually you'll just kind of get moksha and sling yourself back out into pure brahman. In Jainism, we're stuck in samsara because we get this karma stuff stuck to us. And we want to extricate it and get rid of it. Once you finally are able to scoop it all out and clean yourself up through extreme non-harm, you'll get out of the cycle. Not to be rejoined with brahman, because there is no brahman there. But just, no, you're, you're gone, you did it. You're out. So that's it. But the notion here, samsara, that, cy that cycle is still here in Buddhism as well. How it functions is a little bit different too, and what dharma means, what karma means is going to be different here. But here's what at least Buddha realizes knowing something about samsara. What do we know about the world? And this list here is called the Chatwari Arya Satyana. See that? I can show you just how Indo European language here. Like Chatwari, like cats in French, four. Four, Arya, that's like Aryan, noble, Satyani, like Satya, true. Okay, Shadwari, Arya, Satyani. So the great four truths that are false. What are they? There are four here. And the last one needs some expansion that we'll really start with next time. What's the first principle? Principle number one. Dukna. <laughs> this is going to make its way onto another list in Buddhism as well. Like the three things in Buddhism that, if there are three things you need to know, here's one of them. Let's call the Chilaksana. We'll get to that in a little bit. But here, what do you need to know? Dukkha exists. What is Dukkha? Suffering. And literally, I, we actually saw this word come up in Jainism too. Right? Dukkha, like like when they when they were doing the thing where they were apologizing, when they were saying, "May my may my may my harm be lacking." So the word dukkha actually means like a lacking. Because I don't, when we think of suffering, we think of, oh, extreme pain. No. What 
Buddha means by dukkha, or suffering. Really, the word means like lacking. We have this, and this will go into the second truth as well, but we don't have, and when we don't have something, what do we do? We want it. Okay? So really, there's this emptiness. Suffering is really this feeling of emptiness. Kind of like thirst. Like even if you're not like, I don't mean like thirsty like you've been, like you've been on an island with no water for weeks. Okay. But let's just say like, even if you're like right now, you're like, you know what, I'm a little parched, I can go for a sip of water. That feeling right there, that's suffering in the sense of lacking. You don't have something, you know, you're like, I want that. But dukkha is this feeling of emptiness, and we've all got it. Because almost all of life is, I don't have that. And it changes from moment to moment. I don't have that. Because what do, think about even how our lives are structured. We think of ourselves as what we don't have. And then what I'm going to get, like when I get more money, when I graduate, when I do this, when I'm making this much a year, I'm going to get this car, I'm going to get this house, I'm going to do this. Everything is already a list of things I'm going to eventually get as soon as I can get them. I don't have that now, and my identity is tied up with that thing that I don't have, but I'm going to get it eventually. And so, dukkha, the lacking, is related to this next notion. Why do we have lacking all the time? Well, because this. Because we desire. Trishna in Sanskrit. Tana in Bali. Trishna. What is Trishna? Desire. We want stuff. So the dukkha is the lacking. But the lacking comes from the desire. We don't really have, we don't realize that we're empty until we want something. Now think about this. You wouldn't know the things you want unless they already existed out there and you wanted them. You wouldn't, I think of, here I think of the words of Steve Jobs, all right, the former, the deceased head of Apple, who said, we're going to give consumers the products they don't even know that they need. I'm going to think of it like 20 years ago. Did anybody have a smartphone? No. I was there, <laughs> right? I remember. And I was an adult then, too, so I remember. But... And we got everything got along just fine. I'm not one of these people that's gonna be like, oh, I was a golden age back then. It was not. no things are things that at least technologically are better now for sure. Okay, but somehow we survived at the same time too. Like it just was like you know what, we don't need a phone to do anything. I had to look at maps sometimes, so it's more convenient today for sure. But we somehow we did it. I don't know how some people did it. Okay, back then. But then now, like the idea of not having certain technologies to me is inconceivable. Right? Like, we just, it's just obvious. How could we get along without it? To the point where it's like so, it feels like it's necessary. I, I can't imagine not having like a computer or a phone today. Okay, and I'm not talking, I don't talk to people on the phone. I'm not sure about that. I'm talking about just communicating and doing all kinds of, like, just my, my daily routine. The, the idea of not having those things is completely foreign to me. Yeah. And you wouldn't desire it. If that lacking is not being presented. So there's a sense in which when stuff gets introduced in the world, we're like, I want it. Now we realize that we don't have something once it comes once we have the desire for it. And that could be all kinds of things. It could be anything I'm mentioning like technology. It could be commodities. You know, I'll, I want that thing. So I've been talking about phones, but it could be I want that car, I want that house, what have you. It could be related to sexual desire. That person, that's who I desire. I'm after that. Whether it happens or not, that desire to be consuming. It could be that. It could be other kinds of physical kind of desire. Like I'm, <laughs> right now, maybe I want tacos. I realize that I'm lacking. Okay, now I want to go after it. Okay, but those, those desires produce that feeling of lacking. And that feeling of lacking is suffering. We're, and we're constantly in this feeling of, I need this thing, I need this thing, I need this thing. Okay, I need food. Okay, sure. I need sex. But I need a big house. And I need a big car. And I need... I don't just want, I need it. Okay, if life is suffering, well, how do we get rid of suffering? It's a simple syllogism. Okay, if, if we've got, if we put the first two together here, if we've got suffering, that's point number one, suffering, there's dukkha. Okay, and the suffering comes from desire, and this is a causal relationship, desire causes suffering, if A, then B, then, um, 
how do you get rid of the suffering then? Get rid of the desire, and then you get rid of the suffering. Sounds simple. That's it. All right. So, whereas in Jainism, when we're talking about extricating the karma goo that sticks to you, here it's get rid of the desire. Now, notice here, it's not, it's not getting rid of the harm as such. That was Jainism. Get rid of the desiring. It's the, I want this. Stop it. Get rid, you get rid of that desiring, you get rid of the suffering. And what Buddha will say here, too, also is when we're like, no, 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 no. I want stuff. That's our, this is our temptation here. Is we, want, we want to hold on to our desiring because we think our desiring is a part of who we are. I am the things I want. And if I have to go, no, I don't want those things anymore, it really seems like an inconvenience to ourselves. Am I really me anymore if I don't get to do the things that I want to pursue? Yeah, but it says, well, yeah, that's your problem. You're really into you. Stop it. Well, unless you like going, unless you want to come back again in the cycle of samsara, because that's the goal here, too. We're wanting to get out of the cycle. And, if you do, and this is the way out. So for Hinduism, it's Dharma. For Jainism, it's Ahimsa. For Buddhism here, it's this. The Chalari Arya Satyani. All right. Follow, realize these four realizations, these truths of the Buddha, of which the fourth one is what? Freedom from the suffering is possible. So how do you do this? All right, we, all right. we've concluded so far. All right, suffering exists. Suffering comes from desire. And if you narota, you get rid of the desire, you'll get rid of the suffering. Well, that sounds great in theory, but how do you do it? Freedom from suffering. Nirvana. Sometimes the word moksha is used here, too, to be fair. But, and nirvana is a term, you'll find it in Hinduism if you look carefully, and you'll find it in Jainism. Look, again, the vocabulary comes up, if I'm, if I'm using a word about one, it's coming up in all the other Indian religions that have different nuances. But it's most closely associated with Buddhism. Nirvana, which is, literally means... <sighs> To exhale, to blow out. Now, there's some ambiguity there. Does it mean to blow out oneself? Here. Nirvana. Sometimes nirvana. Does it mean to blow out oneself? Or does it mean to blow out things that are bad? Like candles on a cake? What, is, what does it mean? I'll come back to that in a second. I'll just say nirvana are getting, and getting out of, and then what is nirvana? Getting outside of the cycle of some self. Stopping it. Now here, are we rejoining Brahman? No. Is there a God here? No. So in that sense, it's closer to Jainism. Like we're, we're getting outside of the cycle, but we're not going anywhere. Okay? We're getting outside of samsara, but we're not, we're not going back into Brahman. We're not joining the one. Granted, there are different schools in Buddhism as well, or denominations, of which the biggest ones are Mahayana and Theravada, that are going to say some different things. Those, because they're such, because this one is such a big religion, I'm going to spend like that. Is there, there are a lot of world adherents. I am going to zoom in on some of those uh, differences later on. But there are many, many schools, and even the Mahayana and the Theravada. We could zoom into those, and there's a lot of subdivisions as well. So there's a lot of Buddhist traditions, just like there's a lot of Christian traditions. Okay, but these are far less familiar, I think, to most Westerners. But how do we get to that Nirvana? Okay, we got the basic thing down. All right, get rid of the desire. Well, how do we do that? Through the Aryastanga Marga. So again, again, we see it again. There's Arya, there, it's true. Anga, that means like eight. Marga, Maga, that's like a path. I'll make you walk on. Really, it's more of the noble eight root. <laughs> What's that? Well, that is where I'm going to start next time. Okay, and what that, I'll just I'll briefly say, it's things like having the right set of thoughts, doing the right kinds of actions. It's eight things that you, every situation you find yourself in, go about it the right way. If you do that, you'll, do, you'll end up doing this. So you, it's, it's the how to get rid of the desire. Because you can't just say like, oh, I'm gonna get rid of the desire now. I'm gonna go walk, I, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm hungry, I think I'm gonna go, I just desire it again. So it's one thing to just say it, how do you do it? You go about, you use the Arya Stenga Marga. So I'll come back to that next time. Thank mm -hmm. you.